Hello friends, welcome to engineering tutorial. So today we are going to resume our discussion on uh, signals and systems. So far we have discussed, uh, you know, in the signals and si systems playlist, we have uh, covered some basic introductory topics. Uh, we have uh, just finished, you know, you know, in the, uh, if you just see the last video of uh, the signals and systems playlist it is uh, it was about the combined signal operations before that we performed individual specific signal operations such as uh, amplitude scaling time shifting time reversal uh, and all that then we performed the combined signal operations before that we discussed many other basic introductory concepts so in this video in the next series of videos we will be focusing on the classification of signals okay the various categories in which we can study signals and each category gives us a different point of view or a different aspect, a different feature of the signal, okay, which is under study. So we know that a signal basically is a source of information, okay, it is a source of data or information. Now we can uh, classify the signal in different ways okay in different ways we can classify some of the broad categories the general categories in which they are generally classified which you will find in many uh, you know textbooks which are prescribed for signals and systems or communication systems whichever one they are the broad categories in which signals can be classified they are first let us use a different ink for that first the first classification which is the most important one continuous time signal and discrete time signal okay this is the first classification we will be studying them in detail individually in separate videos first let us let me just give you the uh, the overall picture of what we are going to cover in the next series of videos and then we'll proceed one by one first is continuous time uh, and that is discrete time the other one the second one is deterministic and random signal okay this is uh, another category then we have three periodic and non periodic signals this is another category okay in which we can uh, study signals in which we can divide signals then another important category a very important category which is energy and power signals this is an important category then is even and odd signals this is an important category and then we have causal anti-causal and non-causal signals this is 
an important category and another ca uh, category which is uh, also used is on the basis of the dimensions the number of functions the number of variables uh, which are dependent the signal is dependent on for its uh, representation and another one is the channels the number of channels so that can be multi channel or multi dimensional signals okay these are the common classifications the common categorizations under which the uh, you know signals are studied each of these classification it brings a different side a different way of looking at the whole you know the study of signals if we categorize them into these sections then we will get to know a different picture a different side a different point of view of uh, of sign just like looking at a monument or a structure from different angles from different uh, you know uh, elevation angles or different sides it gives us a different side of you know a different view just like that so we'll be focusing on each of these uh, classifications in separate videos so first continuous time signal and discrete time signal we'll study okay so here we'll be discussing the first category which is continuous and discrete time signal this is the first category which you will find everywhere where uh, the classification of signals is given now suppose we represent a signal let's say like this where we represent the signal amplitude as a function of time and this is the time axis and we represent a signal like this like this like this okay this is the signal that we represent and in another uh, case we represent the signal like this okay like this what is the basic difference between these two representations this representation it is called as the continuous time domain representation or a continuous time domain signal okay and this one is a discrete time domain representation okay or a discrete time signal this is the origin reference and here the n which is called as the discrete time axis it can take only integer values 1 2 3 here it is minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and so on okay like this here the signal values the value of xt if you see the value of xt here for this continuous time domain signal it exists at each and every point of time it is continuous any two points on if we just take it to the time axis in between these two points let's say t1 and t2 in between t1 and t2 all the 
points all the time you know instants between t1 and t2 such a small range between t1 and t2 each and every point has some value of xt okay some value of xt but here in discrete time domain representations the values of the signal they exist at only discrete time instance specific time instance which take integer values n this is a discrete time n this is continuous time t and the whole process of conversion of a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal it involves sampling and quantization these two process these two techniques then further another encoding technique is used to convert it into pulse waveforms or digital waveforms okay that is a different thing we'll discuss it when we'll discuss digital communication so basically what involves just a uh, quick idea i will give you what happens in sampling and quantization is that let's say we have a signal okay basic sine signal we we'll take okay it is in the continuous time domain this is let's say uh, the peak value of the signal in the positive direction this is in the negative direction this is the continuous time domain uh, representation to convert it into discrete time a technique called as sampling is used what happens in the sampling process is that values of these signals called as samples are taken at specific time instants specific time instants which is given as per the nyquist sampling criteria okay nyquist sampling criteria Ny nyquist sampling theorem which states that in order to recover the original signal or the continuous time signal from the discrete time signal the number of samples or the sampling frequency must be greater than or equal to twice of the maximum signal frequency okay this is the sampling criteria it means that the number of samples that should be taken it should be greater than twice of the maximum signal frequency okay so the number of samples are taken which is as per the nyquist sampling criteria and then after that once we get all the samples which which is get which is converted into like this this kind of a representation here next thing is to assign a value to each of these specific time instants the amplitude values again the amplitude values can take a whole range of values a continuous range of values xt can take a continuous range of values so for that in order to convert xt to xn quantization technique is used where what happens the total amplitude range that is mp and minus mp the maximum value of the signal in the positive direction and the maximum value of the signal in the negative direction they are combined together okay the total value is divided into a number of sta standard levels and this is called as the quantization level which is equal to 2 mp by n so the total amplitude range the total variation of this continuous time signal 
the amplitude values that it can take which falls in between this plus mp and minus mp value it is divided into a number of standard levels so where l can be 1 2 3 4 like that it can take any number of values okay so each value of this quantization level that is qal1 for l is equal to 1 qal2 for l equals to 2 and th likewise it can take many values so each of these sampled values they are rounded off to the nearest quantized level let me give you an example uh, an example to make you understand it suppose one of the quantization levels ql1 is equal to let's say 2 qal2 is uh, 4 let's say qal3 is 6 qal4 is 8 and so on and one of the sampled values which uh, we got here let's say one of the sampled values we got is let's say 1.8 Okay, this is the sampled value that we got. So this 1.8 is close to this first level, okay, quantization level QA, Q delta L1. So it will be rounded off to this, okay, 1.8 is nearly equal to 2, so it will be rounded off to this. Let's say we got another sampled value as 5.7, okay, we got this. So this sample value is close to this third quantization value of the quantization level that is 6. So it will be rounded off to 6, it will be represented as 6. Similarly, one of the quantized, uh, the sample values we got was let us say 7.7, .7. okay. This is close to this, so it will be rounded off to this. So here one thing which is important is that the more the number of levels okay that is the number of l values the more we will have these quantization levels and hence the accuracy of quantization will be more so to increase the accuracy of quantization we have to use more levels that is more number of l values Okay, the more the number of levels, the more accurate the quantization process is. So, like that, uh, we will be, don't worry, we will be discussing it in detail in digital communication. Here, just I wanted to give you a general idea, that's why. I, so, a lot of other things uh, there, if uh, I would have included it here, it would have been unnecessarily, I would have confused you. So, just to give you a general idea, this. So, like, through these two process, sampling and quantization, we convert a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal, okay. So there are a number of advantages of doing it, uh, advantages of discrete time signals or digital signals over analog signals. We have discussed it in, in communication systems, we have discussed in, in the introductory parts of signals and systems, okay. So, this is the classification of continuous time signal and discrete time signal, okay.